hardware encryption and um, how that works and integrates into DOE technology. And today he's going to be talking about um, the relationship between government and commercial um, products. Um, since she uh, introduced the idea that I'm working on various panels, so I'm not, I will go ahead and tell you about that. I served on the President's Export Council, um, which was a, a group of distinguished um, industry people who advised the administration on export policy, and in that capacity served as the uh, chairman of the subcommittee on encryption policy. And that subcommittee was the one that recommended and did achieve the relaxation of export controls in the United States, which has now been followed by the relaxation almost everywhere else in the world that was still using export controls. Um, that's only uh, noteworthy because I am a former deputy director of NSA, so some of my colleagues didn't like <laughs> that. But uh, if you want to talk about that at all, as a philosophical policy piece, I'd be happy to add that in at the end. Because uh, I felt very strongly about those changes being necessary. Uh, the second thing is that uh, uh, I served on the Department of Energy, uh, or served as chairman of the Department of Energy group after the Winho Lee affair, which investigated and made recommendations on how to fix the network and computer security problem. Uh, in the laboratories and at DOE. And uh, that was one of the more interesting and dumb things I ever did. <laughs> uh, because it, it uh, was a, a very difficult and not very, uh, uh, it was a thankless job. Uh, the third thing is I'm now in the Scowcroft Commission that is uh, uh, doing a study of nuclear command control, including information security uh, surrounding nuclear command control. The purpose of which is to assure that uh, our nuclear capabilities are available when we need them and to make sure that they can never be used by anyone uh, unless it's authorized. Uh, that's an interesting and ongoing project that I'm involved in. Uh, I like doing those things because it's very taxing um, on the brain. Here's what I thought I would uh, go through. and. Uh, I'm going to emphasize cryptography. We can also talk about firewalls and antivirus, all the other pieces of the puzzle if you want to. Uh, talk a minute about the business need. Uh, what's happening in the world is fairly clear, whether you read Alan Toffler's books of 31 years ago or, or you read the newspaper of yesterday. Uh, information is becoming a business. Information is making businesses succeed or fail. I had on my desk some statistics from PC Magazine uh, yesterday, which showed the return on investment from uh, network-based, not internet, but network-based businesses, uh, was more than twice the return on investment of non-network working businesses. And you can probably figure that out very quickly in that the costs associated with operating outside the network are higher than the cost of working inside the a lot of leverage there. So information is now a business, but there's a lot that goes along with information, sensitivity and liability, that uh, uh, we have to think about as we deploy businesses and networks. And it's the threats. Um, this is a slide which I got to go back and anticipate the number is really a billion in 2003, uh, not two, not three billion. But at any rate, it's growing rapidly. And if you're doing business on the internet, uh, you have about 300 million of your closest friends there to help you do business, um, whatever that motive is going to be. So let's talk about the threats. Why is the internet such a threatening place? Well, one is that there are a lot of people who reside on it. But the most important thing is everyone who resides on it has access to every other place on the internet. We use operating systems, routers, and telephone switches that assure that everyone is connected to everyone else at all times. And TCP IP is not 
a protocol that was invented in order to assure privacy and security. It was a protocol that was invented to assure that everyone can be in touch with everyone else. And the thing I like to say is that on the internet, everyone, or anyone rather, at any time can um, contact or be uh, able to enter anyone else's system at any time and then the real problem for any purpose. Um, so we now have all these interconnected infrastructures. There are lots of uh, uh, ways that uh, routers are not secure. Uh, for one thing, they don't always know who the other routers are that they should be talking to and that they're all that's to talk to. And, and then, of course, the fact that it's all a global system means that now you have policy and law also entering into it. Um, we have 47 nations now trying to draw up a treaty on punishing people who misuse or who do illegal acts uh, on the internet. A real challenge there. I, I must admire them for going after this policy issue that way, which is in a multinational way. Because 215 countries putting together bilateral agreements uh, is 214 factorial, or minus one factorial, numbers of uh, uh, combinations of permutation. So that would have been impossible. But just imagine that what is illegal in one of those 47 nations by our standards may not be illegal in that nation. And also remember that we're not a nation that likes to subject our population to prosecution by other states without recourse to our justice system. So it's still going to be a challenge to put together uh, ways of dealing with criminal activities on the internet. And by the way, it will not just be the internet uh, because all networks are connected and so that's going to make it even more challenging. It is Increasingly true that communications do not travel from point to point. They don't even travel from IP address to IP address in any kind of direct fashion. They essentially go through the path of least resistance. And in telecommunications, the path of least resistance is the path of least cost. So if you want to analyze a set of communications between Philadelphia and New York, as I once did, for reasons of trying to determine how someone may have gotten, may have gotten access to them, you will find that uh, the communications go all over the world. They pass through other nations, they pass through lots of cities that are on the direct path, and in the case that I looked at, uh, because it was a very important one, they actually pass through the same city three times. And that's not unusual at all. So um, information is more available for intercept and for uh, access than it was uh, before. In fact, I'm going to share with you uh, something I pulled off the net today about wireless telecommunications that you'll find rather fascinating. Um, but we'll save that for later. Um, I was in DOE for a meeting of the Scope Prep Commission, and I was on the eighth floor, and I was with the head of the nuclear, um, the NNSA, as it's called, the Nuclear uh, Security Agency. And uh, we were leaning up against the wall talking, and all of a sudden I realized that we were leaning up against the wall next to the communications closet, and that the door was unlocked, and in fact was wide open, and that I could walk into the wiring closet and have access to the entire DOE um, network. Uh, if you think that happens in DOE, which is a closed, uh, protected facility, think about it in name of the telco company, name all the companies that provide services to the telco companies. It's a, it's a real problem. And so you have lots of vulnerability to deal with. And it is not possible 
to say that they're a protected past in the commercial world. 95%, by the way, of DOD communications uh, travel over commercial patents. Uh, you can take out Millstar and a few other things, which, by the way, those are just easier. They're not. <laughs> and, uh, and so you, you have a real access problem. Uh, talk a minute about operating systems. Uh, while everyone understands that NT is a vulnerable uh, system, uh, it's, of course, less well known that Unix and Linux are vulnerable systems. And the truth of the matter is that despite 25 years of investment in laboratories like the one here, we still don't have a secure operating system. And I will make a, a prediction that we will never have a secure operating system uh, unless we are willing to live with an out-of-date operating system. Uh, because essentially the churn in the operating system where you're forever improving its capabilities, patching bugs, and all of that sort of thing, continually creates more vulnerabilities. Um, Scilink, my company, uh, produces uh, uh, encryptors which can be managed through SMMP. As far as I know, we're the only ones who actually provide a secure form of SMMP. Version 3 of secure SMMP is only DES, digital encryption standard, 56 bits. So uh, there are a lot of vulnerabilities in the management systems. One of our customers, um, who was not using our security SMMP walked into uh, walked into work one day, and all of their switches, and they're they're a provider of value-added telecommunication services. All of their switches had been turned off by an insider who had been fired and who gained access to their SMMP. Um, it probably would not surprise you that most organizations, whether they're business or government, have no knowledge, have no current knowledge on a day-to-day -day basis of whether or not there are modems connected to their network. Everyone does it, probably for the best of reasons. There's uh, need to test something, there's a need to gain access at night because they want to work on something, lots of different reasons. But I used to have a group that went around and tested networks and every single network they tested had an illegal modem and the only, it, it's very easy to find them. If the company or the government agency has a dialing block, like 688, or in our case 855, you just put a demon dialer on it and you find all the modems. And then you go and try them all. And it's pretty easy to find them. And if they're there, illegally, more than likely, they don't have any password protection or anything else. And the rest of these, I think uh, everyone's been introduced to before. I would just say that every time you go to a counterintelligence case in history, or to a case in which there has been very large um, fraud or, or uh, monetary value uh, involved in, in penetrations of networks, you find people at the root of those uh, activities. There's a really great article, I would recommend you read it, uh, from ASAP Magazine in 1999, you can find it on the web. Forbes.com, uh, and the article is entitled, How to Hack a Bank. And they were criticized royally when they published it, but quite frankly, it's one of the best, most authoritative articles I've ever seen, because it describes how insiders work with outsiders who conduct attacks to make the attacks more successful. And if there's real money involved, they don't like getting caught. They don't even like there being any evidence that they were there. And of course, if you're an attacker or you state sponsored, uh, you have some, some of the same kind of uh, goal. 
people end up being a very crucial part of this whole security apparatus. Uh, I was able to update to the new 2000 CSI and FBI uh, computer crime survey. There were some very notable differences between this one and earlier versions. Um, first of all, the percentage of corporations and government agencies we, uh, who actually detected breaches, breaches, not attempts at breaches, detected breaches, is now up to 85%. Up from about 55 percent to two years ago. Um, the number willing to acknowledge financial loss anonymously uh, is uh, up to 65 percent in round numbers. Um, most were unwilling to say how much they lost, but um, a third of those reported $377 million in losses. I can tell you from cases I know about that are unpublished that the number probably is a lot larger as you see from the slide. What they don't report is the loss to their business as opposed to the loss of fraud. And there is a difference. Um, and notice that the internet as a point of attack is increasing. And that's a, a surprise. We have in past years talked about the attack potential primarily being an insider uh, attack. And it, I think three years ago the number was 85%, and uh, two years ago it was like 55 to 60% of the attacks were from insiders. And now the point of attack is primarily from outside. That does not mean that the insider was not involved. And some small portion reported to uh, the police, and that's a real serious problem. Here's an example of an incident. Uh, uh, I would say this is fairly typical of, of an industry whose business is based upon internet access or network access. And you'll see that the biggest loss is if, if you lose access to the backbone of your business, you lose business. So this is kind of typical of a, an AT&T or an ABOVENET or an Exodus or, um, or any of the companies that are really network based. Uh, in addition, there are uh, often real losses in terms of fraud. And uh, we know from the Citibank attack of several years ago where a Russian set of hackers working with an insider uh, were able to transfer $100 million, of which $90 million was recovered immediately, um, that uh, when Citibank chose to make that public, that it cost them dearly in loss of accounts to their competition. Uh, there is one article in the internet that says they lost upwards of a billion dollars uh, to competition. So, I haven't told you anything you didn't already know. It's a very serious problem. It's a very difficult problem. It's a very widespread problem. So, what is business doing about it? And I can tell you from being the CEO of a public company, not enough, but we'll go into more detail. Um, right now, we're going through a change from when people uh, said, hey, I'm in charge of my security and it's really not important that I tell anyone else about what I'm doing in the security arena. Y2K changed all of that, I think, uh, in the sense that people realized that uh, Y2K was a serious threat, it had a deadline, and um, the SEC made it mandatory that people report on what they were doing to mitigate uh, problems. Uh, today, what we're seeing is that if you go to a company like Chase Bank, uh, Chase is selling uh, network provided corporate banking services and they now sell the network services with it. In other words, they prescribe uh, with their partners what the level of security is. And uh, fortunately, uh, they have to prescribe sign-up equipment. But, Nevertheless, 
us. Uh, uh, the fact that it's moving toward um, partners having some voice in how well you protect their information is significant. Uh, I've, I've written in several articles recently that I believe where we're going, not just because of security, but also because of privacy, is toward a world in which uh, businesses will be made are lost on the basis of how much attention they pay to security. I don't know how soon we're going to get there, uh, but I'm personally campaigning for some kind of reporting requirement on uh, public companies uh, that they have in fact dealt with the issue. I'm not going to go through these. These are things you, I think, know and understand. But I would just comment on new processes, cost saving and efficiency. Uh, that's where I think security in terms of marketing is going. One of the things we'll get into as we talk about the technology is that the technology is moving away from just being a risk avoidance technology. There are business enablement pieces to the technology, like digital signature, uh, data integrity, non-repudiation. Uh, these are all business process enhancements and uh, I think uh, will increase the pressure for using uh, security. In an ideal world, it's not, you shouldn't define how much security is needed and then you go off and try and fit it to the business. That's what I will openly admit and leave the camera on that we used to do in the defense department with regard to information security. Um, it took 17 seconds for the push to talk radio in a fast flying jet in the Vietnam War to synchronize with the other radio. Uh, and that just wasn't acceptable to pilots. In 17 seconds, they could fly a pretty far distance. It takes 17 seconds today for the secure telephone unit, the SCU-3, to synchronize. So we haven't come very far. We've changed the method of, of key synchronization, uh, but it still is an interruption to doing business. In business, what's happening is people are saying, hey, yeah, I want security, but I, don't, I want to make sure I'm focused on the business I'm in. And I contend that DOD will want to do that for the future as well. I'm certainly seeing it in the nuclear command control area where you define what you're trying to do. You know, assure launch and protect against uh, uh, accidental launch. And then you build the system around it. Uh, but eventually you come up with something and it's never going to work perfectly. You have to monitor the results and you have to refine it. In the early days, this is what business did to try and get some semblance of, 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 uh, of security protection. Dialback modems, you may not remember those, but that's where you dialed, it answered, and then uh, it hung up on you, and you hung up, and it would dial you back and connect to the modem. It was a, a way of making sure that uh, the two ends authenticated each other. Interesting, uh, simple way of doing it, uh, but it was time to uh, We have security tokens, we still have security tokens, and uh, things where you put, put a number in the one-time password system. We still have firewalls, they haven't gotten any better. They're still, as we'll talk about, inadequate but necessary ingredients in security. Uh, and then we used to do a lot of assessments and policy and risk management uh, kind of thing. Now, we, we still do some of these. I'm not saying we don't. I'm just saying that we've got some, some new tools. Let's talk just for a second about firewalls. I do this because I never consider any security solution uh, totally adequate. I believe in, in defense and depth, as you can see. But firewalls are rule-based security. Essentially, you define a rule. An IP address may talk to another IP address or it may not, or if it does, it does so under certain conditions, including the time of day, the proxy, all these different ways that you can find. 
The trouble is that if the rules are known and understand, and they often are because they often are the factory settings, uh, then an attacker knows how to fashion their attack so that they get through uh, the firewall. Um, I think, by the way, the same thing can be said of intrusion detection techniques. Essentially, they're rule understand. If the rules can be understand, uh, they can. I, my, one of my last acts when I was at NSA was that I oversaw the uh, running of eligible receiver. And uh, there were a lot of um, uh, DOD components who thought they were protected by intrusion detection, who were very surprised to find out uh, the morning the attack came that uh, they always expected their attacks to come from a single IP address. And they never ever never thought about an attack that co could come from a different IP address every packet. And so they just fell one right after another. Uh, so firewalls are like this. If you want a lot of security, you can get it from a firewall, but you're not going to be able to do much. So the minute you set a rule that says something can happen, you begin to erode uh, the security. Today, where we're focused is on authentication, encryption of the connections between facilities, sites, local area networks, and wide area networks, remote access uh, via IPsec, um, public key infrastructure as a way of providing not only strong authentication, but also the basis for business processes like digital signature and non repudiation, and also for uh, certification of delivery and a whole bunch of other things which we could talk about. And then finally, uh, uh, secure security management and hardware encryptors that provide the overall umbrella of, of protection against listening in. Um, there are non-cryptographic things I could add, like uh, uh, some intrusion alerting systems. They're not intrusion detection, they are merely intrusion alerting systems so that you can go find out if you're being attacked. Uh, and of course, the very important ingredient today of antivirus, which is a backward looking technology, always looking for the attacks that have already been done. Um, so I, what I want to do is emphasize the role of cryptography and how it can enhance uh, our ability to feel security that can withstand uh, uh, attacks. Mm -hmm. When you say secure security management, um, you emphasize security. So that, what do you mean by that? Uh, let's take a hardware encryptor. Yeah. Um, you're going to have to manage that device. Um, the way Silent does that is we put in every single hardware encryptor a digital certificate, which we issue at the factory. When the user gets a piece of hardware, uh, they take a secure security management platform that we may call Privacy Manager, which authenticates, and does dual authentication, because we've authorized them to access this particular digital certificate. And they set up a conversation, and then they inject their own root certificate. By the way, they first they verify the certificate's still there because it's not been tampered. Because uh, we have tamper devices on all of these. And then they build their own root, their own public key root. They then sign the certificate, inject it into the hardware encryptor, and then they notify all other encryptors, like in an ATM uh, cloud or whatever that may have to talk with this hardware encryptor, what its certificate is, and whether or not it's authorized to have a conversation. All of that done with a security management platform that is encrypted end to end to the hardware encryptor. So that, that's, that is as tight as you can make. You're taking the security management out of the, the general infrastructure it, mess. Yes, and it is your Achilles heel. This, if I want to attack, Hardware encryption, routers, all that. I just use SMTP. I can turn switches on and off. I can set routing tables. I can 
I can do with lots of fun things that I used to do. <laughs> uh, I think most of this is pretty obvious. The low cost of ownership has to do with the fact that uh, you can scale this stuff and you can make it easy to manage. And uh, uh, then you can provide for transaction-based trust, which is important to business. I think you may know all of this, but I'll let you read it just for a second. Because my definitions are very carefully crafted out of words that I understand. And you may find some of them um, different from your own understanding. I consider public key only valuable for key distribution and digital signature. It is not an encryption system for data. And I hope everyone understands that. Okay. So, what made Silent a different company from everyone else in the business is that we were the first to use public key to be able to distribute symmetric keys that were being used for hardware devices. Why did we do that? Because unlike the government, which was quite content to ship 80 tons of king material to the desert in 1990, uh, late 1990, early 91, the banks are not willing to ship 80 tons of king material all around the world and expose it to theft and all those kinds of things. And they wanted a key distribution method very, very low cost, and, and also didn't allow people to have access to symmetric keys. And that's what Silent built, and that's what is in common use today with Diffie Hellman, which is a patent we got in the early days. Uh, it's very scalable. Citibank, for example, has 5,000 of our devices in their network. Uh, you can change the encryption keys uh, every hour, every five minutes, every minute, if you want to. Uh, we, we recommend people set policies, and you can reduce the threat to, uh, from human beings. Access control is the other uh, issue that can be dealt with for public uh, key methods. Um, because the private key is only known to the user, and usually, by the way, isn't even known to the user, it's usually only known to the user in encrypted form. Um, it can be used to sign documents, to authenticate the originator, uh, and to, with a timestamp and several other things, uh, if you will, authenticate an event, which means you can't refute that you, you participated in the transaction. Um, furthermore, you can use public key to uh, encrypt certain small amounts of data for privacy. One of the things that seems to have been forgotten in most of the solutions that have been employed with SSL, for example, is that authentication is a two-way street. Um, for example, um, when you sign on to your bank for um, home banking, I do understand that it's important for the bank to know who you are. It's also important for you to know that it's your bank <laughs> and not uh, the uh, uh, Bank of Jamaica as opposed to the Bank of America. And so two-way authentication is extremely important. Uh, you know that they're evolving methods. I'll just tell you now some pledges. This is a long way off. It's not a technical issue in terms of can we measure minutia on fingerprints and so on. There really are two issues with regard to biometrics. Uh, the first one and the, and the easier one to solve is uh, binding the biometric to a uh, public key or to an identity uh, in a way in which it, uh, identities can't be uh, stolen. Uh, the second is privacy. And I contend that's a hard one to solve. I have not seen any biometric system uh, that 
if you tried to introduce it in a widespread manner in our society, it wouldn't be attacked by a couple of organizations in our community. Um, the, the issue and the thing that has kept public key from becoming a more ubiquitous solution is the fact that public key infrastructure is so essential to being able to use it. Um, and that you also need a convenient receptacle for people to use. You need a smart card or a token or something that allows people to use this in a convenient way. Otherwise, they will get around it. And you need the PKI itself, and it has to be one that's easy to set up, easy to manage, and uh, easy to use. Uh, I was mentioning just a little while ago that uh, at least two of the public key infrastructure businesses that are public companies have announced in the last week uh, enormous losses. One of them announced a $450 million loss in the second quarter on revenues of $20 million. That's extraordinary. Uh, um, if you use cryptography, you can support a lot of different uh, uh, ways of conducting business on networks. And scalability, our PPI, which is supporting the U.S. Postal Service businesses, is um, at least tested or simulated to be able to support 300 million certificates. We do need to move to ways of managing certificates better. And I, I would like to introduce uh, here one uh, issue that I think has surrounded PKI and we can talk about the questions after software. Uh, I think that uh, the biggest problem with public key infrastructure uh, as it has been approached by businesses so far is that it has been approached as a product. It has been, they have attempted to sell it as a technical product. Um, pretend for a second that you're running um, a banking business or a retail business or whatever. Uh, do you want digital certificates or do you want applications? Why do you want digital certificates? Do you want to have to think of all the reasons that you want them and, and that you might need to deploy them? Or do you want the PKI package to the business? U.S. Postal Service has two businesses. Uh, PC Postage, which allows you to issue stamps on your own ink jet printer. If you were to go to any of the three companies that sell that product today, sell their version of that product, you would never know you were getting a digital certificate. You would just fill out the normal information about who you are and, and so on, and it would become embedded in the application. And the interesting thing is you can't use that certificate, even though it's a standards-based certificate and um, meets all the X.509 standards and so on. You could not use it for anything else except PC Postage. Their second business is NEPO Certified, allows Social Security Administration, HICFA, and others to, to transmit documents across the internet that are certified delivery, digitally signed, authenticated, and encrypted. That's a very, very powerful concept because so Security Administration can now get its reporting from the state penal systems, which is one of its required reporting channels. Um, they can get that electronically and cut two months of float out of cutting off Social Security uh, for um, prisoners. <laughs> That's very, very high return on investment. The environment's getting worse all the time. Um, for the Scowcroft group, I, I did a, a, a fun thing that wasn't so fun after I got to do it. I went to a couple of hacking sites that I knew very well. And I just pulled down some pages of their product literature, the things they were selling. And then uh, I briefed the Scowcroft group on this. And then I later asked 
one of the groups that was doing testing on the good networks whether they were using these tools. And the answer was that they were. One of them, for example, was key, uh, Keystroke Mod. Cost $325. Uh, it's installable on any PC and it reports through a covert channel uh, to any IP address that you know. Uh, you don't have to know anything about hacking to use it. There's a hard disk replica. It costs only about $200. I can remember when that product was developed. <laughs> <laughs> and it's readily available now, commercially available over the internet. So the attack tools have become so prolific and so good that almost anybody can use them, whether they're computer literate or not, or network literate. So I believe in strong defense in depth. Um, and I kind of describe the four areas of security as being encryption, which are varying kinds of encryption depending on the kinds of networks, authentication, and associated uh, pieces of that, uh, including digital signature and so on. Um, firewalls and uh, intrusion detection or anti-intrusion devices and then finally uh, anti-virus. There are others, but I just kind of lump them all into these classes. And I would say that if you don't have something in every class in your network, you probably are very, very small. Um, and by the way, having encryption that you trust but isn't trustworthy, or authentication you trust but it isn't trustworthy, just makes it worse. Uh, one of the things that's happening in the business world that we're trying to deal with is that there are a lot of people, because of the proliferation of IP only kind of thinking, there are a lot of people who think all I have to do is secure the application. And they forget about these keystroke monitors, all the things I can deploy into a network if all I've done is secure the application that can uh, allow uh, for very uh, strong attacks. Uh, security management, we talked about this one enough, I'm not going to reiterate it. Uh, and then uh, my conclusions, I don't think businesses will uh, survive in the future if they don't have strong security. I will tell you that I also think that businesses and governments can't survive if they aren't on the network and therefore making themselves vulnerable. So it is catch-22. Uh, my, my favorite line is, uh, uh, why would I want to go and buy a car on the internet if I can't register it? i got to go stand in line. And so governments and businesses are being forced into network-centric uh, uh, activities. Uh, I believe, I'm skipping down here, that strong cryptography is the only way to deal with these uh, uh, the issues of uh, strength, ease of use, and low cost of energy, scalability. And that's it. Uh, there was an issue that I wanted to talk about off camera. The average U.S. citizen who maybe just has the computer at home is using the internet. They're aware of their awareness and the security. Whether to get to that end user is going to be just waiting for the current generation that's dealing with the computers, growing up with computers, to come of age, or is it possible to educate my parents who won't buy something over the internet type as to the risk? They eventually raise that confidence level. I don't think we can raise the confidence level until we change the security dynamic. The, the internet is an insecure uh, The only reason it's safe for them to buy something over the internet using a credit card is because there's a limit on credit card fraud uh, that to fifty dollars. The truth of the matter is even though the internet doesn't represent uh, a very large proportion of the transactions in the world today, it represents 50% of the problem on credit cards. Uh, so that's a tremendously large issue for them to ignore, because most of them don't know that they're on the lab. Now let's go to internet banking. 
What are you liable for if somebody goes into your bank account and takes all your money? Every dollar. The bank does not have any limits uh, on your liability. And uh, so their security system is very much a part of your thinking. You're, you're thinking at all about security. So I personally don't believe that your parents are thinking about it. Uh, I think that what's happening is that most people uh, see the internet as the wild, wild west. And until they see uh, steady uh, string of prosecutions, steady string of uh, security advances, the reason you use and effective, I think people are going to stay away from using it as a way of doing personal business. Of course, you go to broadband and you create a new dynamic, and that is, you have that IP address sticking out there all the time, and you can pay attack. So unfortunately, it's pretty, we got a long way to go. I think that uh, governments are going to use biometrics for government employees and they can control it and they can tell them what policy is. And I think companies may use, bio, may attempt to use biometrics for their employees. But I think there's going to be a huge division between uh, those uses and any widespread general uses. Now, I'll give you an example of government use that you're going to see within five years, kind of uniform one. You're going to see fingerprints being used um, at uh, immigration naturalization entry points for certainly Israel, Germany, I imagine Japan, and name a bunch of countries who don't have the same standards we do about privacy. We may even do it in this country, although I doubt, I really seriously doubt because of our attitudes to privacy. Um, but I'll give you an example of what I used to do for, again for fun. Uh, we had a face recognition system at NSA. And uh, I used to uh, regularly uh, change, because I could access the, the computer, I used to insert one of my photos, just one of my photos, into the file that was created for anyone else. And when they walk up to the machine, they'd, they'd be recognized as me. Um, and it, 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 was, it was trying to illustrate the point that unless you digitally sign that file, and you did a lot of system things to make sure it couldn't be penetrated and tampered with, that biometrics are no stronger than any system. You're collecting the data, but how are you making sure the data is being used properly? And that's why I think, that's the system reason I think we're all the wise I we're going to see biometrics built into the smart cards anytime soon. Yeah, Siemens has already uh, uh, developed that uh, technology that's not being deployed yet, but it's, uh, I've seen the, the part. Uh, and it fits right into the plastic. The standard format. This is Cyrus uh, badge and you know, a smart card on the back. There's a uh, thumb reader that fits right into the plastic. The same form, form. Exactly the same form. And you also will see the little tokens, the USB tokens that will have a thumbprint, which I think will be very useful for controlling access to the USB. Since you can put a snipper on the USB thing, uh, that could be a way in which you momentarily authorize it to actually unlock the 
DOD has a proud history of forcing technologies on nobody else is. And, and I think that's I think that's understandable. They're forcing it though for a narrow use. Um, and as long as they stick to that narrow use and they don't make the information on those cards available through the network, then they may be able to control <coughs> access to embedded information sufficiently that they won't be able to follow them all over the Along with, if instead they've got all these readers connected directly to the network so that all the information is available to anyone <coughs> in the network, um, then I think they, they may be entering this technology. Thirteen, fourteen years ago, uh, there was a project to automate the command control of the networks. We stopped that project when we got to more than two billion dollars worth of cost. Because we sat down and we understood finally why it was going to be over two billion dollars. And that is, there was no technology available to us then in our space that was. Cool, cool, cool. That it was worth spending that kind of money. 